All right, I just want to show this because the, I believe the Kirby Bauer disk um, is something you'll see in your laboratory. Basically, the idea is you have a series of round filter paper disks. Okay, these filter paper disks are impregnated with different antibiotics. Okay, and they're marked, of course, to identify what the antibiotic is. Okay, some in this case they're just marked, you know, A, B, C, D. I've seen other ones that are actually marked with the, you know, the proper. Um, abbreviation for penicillin or amoxicillin or something like that. Um, so they're marked to identify the drug and they're placed on an agar plate, okay, and that agar plate is essentially covered by a lawn of bacteria. And you might do this with two different types of bacteria, like for instance you might make one plate with a lawn of gram-positive bacteria and another plate with a lawn of gram-negative bacteria. And they make special a special um, dispenser that really makes it very easy to dispense these um, to dispense these discs evenly. Okay, and you can notice just you know by looking at the picture that there's these zones of clearing around some of these. Okay, and then there's smaller zones around here. In this case, it appears like there's no zone of clearing around A. All right. So over time, you let them sit overnight or for a couple of nights, um, and the drugs diffuse into the agar plate. Okay. And when the drugs diffuse into the agar plate, they inhibit the growth of the lawn to, for, at different distances. And what you can do then is you can take a ruler, okay, and you can measure. You can take a ruler, you can measure this in centimeters or millimeters or whatever you'd like, um, and see, you know, what this distance and what this zone of clearing is. You want to get an idea of, of essentially what the radius is. And the diameter, or rather the diameter, I guess I should say, um, of the zone correlates to the minimum inhibitory concentration of the antibiotic. So it, it's really quite simple and quite intuitive. The larger the zone of clearing, you know, the better uh, the antibiotic is at inhibiting, you know, this particular bacterial growth, gram-negative, gram-positive, or specific bacteria if you're looking at something very specific. Um, the agents the organisms target will be different for different antibiotics, which is basically what I said in the previous video when I introduced antibiotics was that you're going to be dealing with um, antibiotics that target different um, that target different structures. Okay, some target cell wall, cell membrane, DNA, RNA synthesis, etc. So with the Kirby Bauer disc discussed, I want to talk more about cell wall antibiotics. Okay. And try to get this all on the screen here. So as I was saying previously, the cell wall is a really good structure to target and that's simply because peptidoglycan does not exist in mammalian cells. Okay, you're not going to find any peptidoglycan so it's perfectly fine to target it and it will be selectively targeted not damaging the host. And thus the antibiotic that target these structures should selectively kill bacteria but not harm the host, what I've been saying all along. And uh, penicillin is an antibiotic derived from cysteine and valine, and which combine to form what I called, and what, which is called, a beta-lactam ring. Okay, and that's where I said all the activity was occurring. Um, this is the reactive part of the molecule, and uh, you can attach different R groups. That's what I was saying. Essentially different, you know, um, functional groups can be added to the ring to change its spectrum of activity, okay? So simply changing some of those functional groups changes the spectrum of activity. It may be able to work on a different organism now. So the specifics of how penicillin works, okay? Penicillin itself resembles the D-ala-D-ala piece of peptidoglycan, and this molecular mimicry allows the drug to bind transpeptidase and trans glycosylase. Okay, those are both called penicillin binding proteins. Okay, so essentially the drug then binds these two penicillin binding proteins and it prevents their activity halting the synthesis of the peptidoglycan chain. And when the cell attempts to grow, it bursts. And it basically bursts due to a lack of cell wall resistance because we know as it grows it needs to have some cell wall resistance pushing back. If there's no resistance pushing back, it's going to just simply lyse. So again, some more information about penicillin. I said it's most effective against gram-positive organisms. 
Uh, and, you know, one of the reasons I, I said, like, intuitively was just that gram-positive organisms have a thicker peptidoglycan cell wall. But another more interesting fact is that the drug has difficulty passing through the gram-negative outer membrane. Recall that gram-negative bacteria have an outer membrane that's not found in gram-positive. So that outer membrane is actually quite difficult to cross. And it's difficult for the drug to cross. So in this case, in the case you have one of these gram-negative bacteria, you're going to want to use ampicillin okay, is used in these cases. And the reason ampicillin is used is because it's better at crossing the outer membrane. And the, to produce ampicillin, you're essentially going to start with the same basic chain and that same basic structure of that I showed you previously of penicillin. You're probably, and you're just going to change one of the functional groups on that beta-lactam ring. So bacteria also can develop resistance to penicillin, and they can do so in two ways. Um, the first is through the inheritance of a gene encoding a beta-lactam ring. Uh, a a beta-lactamase enzyme, rather, uh, which cleaves the beta-lactam ring. So you can have beta-lactamase, and that's going to be an enzyme. It cleaves the beta-lactam ring, and remember I said that's the reactive part of the molecule. If you don't have the beta-lactam ring intact, it's not going to be effective. Um, this is actually kind of, kind of interesting because you have to recall that bacteria have um, horizontal and vertical gene transfer. So what I mean by that is vertical gene transfer. They're transferring genes to their offspring, essentially. So when the cell divides, when it goes through binary fission, you end up with a, you know, a transfer of DNA um, from the mother cell to the uh, new, um, from the parent cell to the new progeny. But you also have horizontal gene transfer between a lot of bacteria, meaning they have different modes of picking up um, DNA from the environment, okay? There, and we're going to talk a lot about that in the near future. But they have different modes of picking up DNA from the, um, like for instance, transformation is, is an example. Um, but the bottom line is they can pick this gene up, okay? And that can result in, in the ability to cleave the beta-lactam ring. The second way is through mutations in genes, encoding key penicillin binding proteins, because we talked about penicillin binding proteins before. And we understand that if you alter the protein, Okay, especially if you alter the protein at the part that the ring uh, binds to, then you're then it's no longer simply penicillin is no longer going to be able to bind. Okay, it's no longer going to the penis, the binding proteins are no longer going to bind penicillin because now they no longer have the necessary um, charge or whatever the case is. There's some mutation that occurs in that binding region, and if that binding region is disrupted in any way, just like an enzyme that's disrupted in its active site, um, any disruption in the active site is usually um, you know means that the protein is no longer going to be functional. And the last little bit on, you know, drugs and antibiotics I want to talk about here is the sulfur drugs, and I talked about them briefly before. I said that they belong to a group of drugs known as the antimetabolites, and that's because they interfere with the synthesis of metabolic intermediates. That's why they're antimetabolites. Ultimately, uh, sulfur drugs act to inhibit the synthesis of metabolic intermediates. Okay, they work to prevent the synthesis of tetrahydrofluoric acid, okay, THF for short, an important cofactor in the synthesis of nucleic acid precursors. So you're dealing with something that's inhibiting nucleic acid precursors. Now, all organisms use THF, okay, including us, okay, to synthesize nucleic acids. So the drug is toxic to bacteria, though, or selectively toxic, I should have said, to bacteria because mammals do not synthesize the precursor THF, THF, folic acid. The folic acid is not synthesized by us. We don't have the metabolic pathway to do so. So by affecting that metabolic pathway, it's not going to, it's not going to affect mammals because we don't have the metabolic pathway, simple, simply. Um, we obtain, you know, folic acid from the diet and such.